Welcome back. Our next talk is about a multi-channel digital amateur TV receiver that is a future project for BATC. Um, it's a follow-on from the ride, the presentation you heard earlier from uh, Tim, and it enables us to receive multiple signals at once. Let's just put that in context. We started off with a uh, long mind written by Heather, uh, just as a Linux app, and that was integrated into Portsdown uh, to form the, the first sort of production receiver. Tim has now taken that into uh, set-top box format, which you see on the right there. Uh, what Winter Hill does, the what this next receiver does, is puts the Raspberry Pi and the tuner on the same printed circuit board and does away with the need for a USB interface. Uh, they, we envisage having two versions of this receiver, the Ride Mark II, which will have the same functionality as Ride and just use slightly different hardware uh, and cheaper hardware, and the Winter Hill, which is a totally different beast. And that will enable you to receive four channels at any one time. So over to Brian, G4EWJ, to tell you about the technical details of the Winter Hill. Take it away, Brian. Good afternoon. This is a short presentation on a different approach to interfacing to the Serit FTS4334L NIM and a brief look at the Winter Hill four channel receive system. Just to recap, the Mini Tuner designed by F60ZP has been the mainstay of DATV reception for many years. It's been built in many forms. Above is the BATC Mark II version, but the common factor is the FT2232H USB input output module. This works very well. It can cope with the high data rates of broadcast transponders, and you can have multiple Mini Tuners connected to a computer. Earlier this year, BATC called for ideas for a self-contained DATV receiver and out of this has come the RIDE project. Also, various ideas were exchanged on the BATC forum about different ways of interfacing to the NIM. These are the basic connections for a standard mini tuner. The NIM connects to an FT2232H module and the module connects to a PC or Raspberry Pi via USB. The data transfer from the NIM is very simple, very much like the old parallel printer port. To use both receivers in the NIM, you'd need two FT2232H modules and two USB connections. The French Mini Tuner Pro units have this using the chip version. The FT2232H module is quite expensive and although it's available much cheaper as a chip, it's very small and not really suitable for general homebrew. So are there any other cheaper ways of doing it? These are the signals between the FT2232H module and the NIM on the standard Mini Tuner. A DVB transmission is split into packets of 188 bytes and the valid signal goes high while the NIM outputs the packet. By inverting the valid signal and outputting one bit at a time, this can be turned into SPI master protocol. Fortunately, the NIM can be configured to do this. This is a closer look at the SPI protocol connections. Many chips use it to communicate with controllers at speeds of up to several tens of megahertz. Two-way communication isn't needed for Winterhill, so the spur data line can be used as a ready signal. The Raspberry Pi 4 has five SPI ports with DMA. With DMA, you tell it to transfer a block of data from a peripheral and let you know when it's finished, so it reduces the overall CPU time. It would be nice to connect the NIM directly to the Raspberry Pi, but unfortunately, the Raspberry Pi SPI ports only operate in master mode, so they can't be directly connected to another SPI master like the NIM. So we still need something between the Raspberry Pi and the NIM. We're only looking for DATV transfer rates such as 2.4 megabits per second for the QO100 beacon, or 7 megabits per second for a terrestrial repeater. So a single microcontroller with three SPI ports can interface to both receivers in the NIM, Combine the data streams 
and send them to the Raspberry Pi on the third SPI port. I looked on the Microchip Advanced Part Selector site and the PIC24FJ256GA702 was the cheapest that could do the job and it even has proper pins on it. Here's the block diagram of the four channel receiver. Having two receivers means you can monitor both sides of a QSO but with so many stations on QO100 a second NIM would be useful to keep an eye on four stations at once. For a QO100 setup starting on the right a splitter feeds the LMB outputs into the top F socket of each NIM. Either receiver in the NIM can be fed from either F socket by using software commands so the bottom two F sockets can be connected to terrestrial antennas and the receiver can be switched to them as required, such as monitoring a local repeater. Optionally, two high-low voltage generator boards can be fitted, or for simpler operation, by turning the LMB on its side. There are two current limited 12 volt supplies on the main PCB. From the NIMS, the two SPI streams are combined by the PIC and sent to the Raspberry Pi, which sends the transport streams over the network. The PICs can be programmed in circuit by the Raspberry Pi, which will please the BATC shop. The SPI6 port on the Raspberry Pi is twinned with the PCM port. This does have a slave mode, so I have some ideas for a small retrofit PCB that would enable reception at broadcast speeds. Here's a look at the development board. There are several surface mount resistors and capacitors, 1206 type, the largest, but there are no multi-pin surface mount chips, so it shouldn't be too difficult to build. In the foreground are the optional RT5047A high-low voltage generator and 22kHz tone boards. At the top of the board, in between the Raspberry Pi and the NIM, is a jumper matrix to feed the four LMB F sockets from one of the voltage generators, or the onboard current limited 12 volts. The connector at the front is for the ride, infrared and the button board. It fits into the same style of blue case as the BATC Mark II Mini Tuner. There should also be plenty of options to fit it into all satellite receiver cases. How does all the data flow around the system? I've taken M0HMO's Longmin software as a base, removed all the USB routines, added support for multiple NIMS and SPI interfacing, and expanded the command input and data output sections. All input and output is done via network UDP protocol, even if you're doing everything locally on the Raspberry Pi. You give the software a base port number, and it assigns the ports it's going to use from this. In the above example, it listens for quick tune commands on ports 9911 to 9914, outputs the corresponding transport streams on ports 9921 to 9924, and outputs the status info on ports 9931 to 9934. The status info is used by ports down to display the receive parameters at the moment. The software listens for quick tune like commands on port 9910. These are quick tune commands with the addition of a receiver number, so any receiver can be controlled from anywhere by programs other than quick tune. Terrestrial receive commands can be sent this way. There are a few problems running multiple VLCs on the Raspberry Pi, so the best way of using the system is by treating it as a hub-stroke server and viewing on a PC. The Raspberry Pi 4 has hardware H.264 and H.265 decoders, which are very efficient, but VLC won't display the beacon when using the hardware H.264 decoder. It's fine if the FFmpeg codec is used, and it's fine on a PC. The H.265 decoder has a colour registration problem on some signals where a whole colour slip occurs downwards. You can only have one VLC using the hardware H.265 decoder or VLC locks up. The FFmpeg software decoder cures all these problems but it's very heavy on CPU resources. A PC doesn't have all the above problems. I also need to make some improvements in the Raspberry Pi SPI driver, so if anyone knows how to write SPI DMA kernel modules for Linux, please get in touch. Here's a screenshot of the Raspberry Pi 4 with all receivers in action. The software starts the four VLC windows and positions them, and inserts the current receive parameters into the title bar in abbreviated form. 
Receiver 4 is using the bottom F socket of the second NIM to display a terrestrial signal. T and B at the right hand end of the title bar indicates top or bottom F socket. The title bar items are displayed in a shortened form to fit more in. For example, on receiver 3, call sign F6BIG, MER 6.7, D3.6, DVBS2, H265, 10499.224 MHz, symbol rate 332K, QPSK, FEC 2 thirds, and top F socket. This is how I use the system on a Raspberry Pi because of the limitations. The FFmpeg codec is running on receiver 1 only. The software only allows H.265 on receivers 1 and 3. The title bar on receiver 2 highlights the fact that it can't display the H.265 data. You can see the H.265 color slip on receiver 3. The box below the VLC windows displays a list of parameters for all receivers. Well that's about it. It's very much a work in progress but heading in the right direction. Thank you. Okay, well off that marvellous presentation, I, what I'd like to do is uh, take questions on uh, the Brian's presentation on the multi-channel uh, DATV receiver. Are you with us, Brian? That's hello, Dave. Yep, good. Okay, what, what I'm going to do is first of all just run through um, these, just remind people with my slides here, um, the fact that we had gone from uh, Linux receivers using the mini tuner through USB and through into a, a potential single channel uh, ride mark two on a single board. And then on the right hand side there, the uh, Winter Hill uh, produced as you've produced. Um, so having done that, let's stop the sharing um, and let's go for the questions. Does anybody have any questions for Brian? Um, the first one I think is from Julian, which is how did you record your presentation, Brian? Let's get started with that one. It was in standard PowerPoint. I uh, recorded a, a voice file for each slide. Um, when I came to try and embed it, I found it was in the wrong format. So uh, Noel uh, ran it on his later PowerPoint and produced a, uh, a WMV, I believe. Okay, next question. Uh, more technical information. Is more technical information about the multi-channel DATV receiver available? Uh, schematic, firmware, source code, GitHub, etc. That's from Janice. Um, no, it hasn't been released yet. It's still in uh, work in progress, so it um, needs a lot of tidying up. But uh, that is the plan. Right, okay, yeah, the plan is this This is very much uh, future capability. Um, I know of two of these receivers are running, but um, it's really a very manual build at the moment, and we're still in the fault-finding stages, aren't we? That's right. It's, um, it's fairly functional at the moment, but uh, there's a lot more to do. Yes, okay. Okay, can you just give us a, an outline of how you control it? Do you, you actually use a mouse to control it? or It's controlled via a quick tune, mainly. Right. Um, the same, same way as you control uh, the, the mini tuner. You set up four receivers in the, um, the quick tune software on uh, port 9911 to 9914. And then you just uh, click whichever receiver you want. Um, and will there be a P PCB at the BATC shop? I can answer that one. There will be, definitely. Um, uh, we have already uh, ordered some prototype ones to make sure that by the time they get into the shop, um, they work first time. Uh, Justin says, can you substitute a more powerful SDI chip to receive broadcast two? That's one I did look at some um, some ARM chips, um, which supposedly went up to forty eight megahertz on the uh, on the SPI bus, but 
but uh, there were some other problems with those, so I had to uh, abandon that one. Um, no doubt there are. Um, probably they'll be a bit more expensive. But as I mentioned, there's um, this retrofit board I'm looking at. Because the SPI-6 is on also twinned with the, the PCM port, uh, that will go very fast. And it's just a question of making the NIM output look like a PCM signal, um, putting the uh, sync pulse in the right place, which can't quite do with the, um, the NIM uh, configuration at the moment. So that's a bit more uh, on the, that's another thing on the development list. Okay, good. Um, any more questions on the questions and answer? I can't see any others there. If anybody else has anything else. Do you have anything to add on recent developments, Brian? Or uh, um, not, uh, not greatly. Um, I mentioned very briefly an extended um, quick tune, something I'm looking at. I'm, uh, I've taken Rob's software and doing a few mods to it. Um, so I want to be able to tie that in, as well as controlling the um, the winter hill. That program will also look at the status coming back out, so you can overlay all the um, receive details that go in the title bar of the uh, the VLC windows. They can be overlaid onto the QuickTune screen, and you can see uh, who's who. Plus, you could also have a receiver, maybe just one receiver scanning round, and it could be. Um, uh, not, not the mod to the uh, the quick tune is it will output the details of its scan each time it gets a pass about four times a second. It will output the the frequency of symbol rate to Winterhill. So Winter Winterhill, if it has a spur receiver, it can go and have a look and see who that is, and send that info back to the um, the extended quick tune screen. And um, then you can see oh so and so has popped up. I'll go and have a look at him. Oh, that's that's amazing. Yeah. What an amazing system. Okay, then. Well, if we have no uh, no more questions, thank you very much for sharing that work with us, Brian. It's good to uh, to show what is coming down the line. And I, I'd just like to emphasize how many people are involved in all these initiatives. You know, they, we tend to get one person driving, but lots of other people feeding in bits like Rob with the quick tune and so on. To, to make this all happen and uh, Mike GZRMJW has done an amazing job designing the PCBs for this as well so uh, lots of work involved from lots of people that uh, hopefully will benefit all the community soon so uh, thank you very much for coming on Brian